Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome to one of the last panels at South by Interactive, uh, and definitely the most august panels of Dan's, at least for the <laughs> afternoon. Uh, that was funny, right? A <laughs> little, little credit. Um, okay, we're very happy to be here today talking with two very different experiences about where media is going. Um, and just to start off very briefly with some predictions. 10 years from today, which of the following will still exist? First of all, Snapchat. Definitely still exists. Yes. What about reporters? Yes, and we better hope they do. <laughs> if, we're, if we remain a free country, we better hope the reporters are back. Yes. The nightly news. I doubt it. No. No. But, but the nightly news will be gone in 10 years. The daily White House press briefing. Will exist, but be very different than it is right now. How so? Well, I think it will, I mean, hopefully be a more enjoyable experience for everyone involved. <laughs> the person doing the briefing, the people asking the questions, the people watching it. But I think the fact of people needing to be in the room to ask that question is going to change. And there's going to be, a, I think, 10 years from now, such a diversity of outlets, there won't be enough seats in the room for everyone who needs to ask questions to be there. So it's going to move online in some form, in some way, over the next 10 years. Well, I have a different opinion. I think probably will not exist. It may depend on the president. Some hmm. president, I could well imagine saying, let's do away with it. What about South by Southwest? Definitely, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> we, want, we want to get invited back. <laughs> Smart answer. OK, uh, let's turn a little bit to recent events before we get too theoretical. Um, the State of the Union, uh, obviously an annual event. This one was handled very differently. Uh, for the first time this year, rather than the remarks being released to a small number of reporters, they were released directly online. And Dan, you were a big part of that. What were you thinking? Sure, I think it's important to understand how the State of the Union has changed over the years. You know, it was appointment television. You could get 90, 100 million people to watch at any one time. The last three years, we've had around 30 million, and that number is going to keep going down as people have different ways of interacting with the State of the Union. And so as we designed it this year, we thought of four groups of audience that we wanted to engage over a period of time. People who are going to watch it on television, and all you really have to do with those people is write a good speech and show up on time. Um, People who will be two screen watchers, and so we developed um, you know, Twitter and Facebook content that went along with the speech, charts, infographics, and links to additional information. The people who would watch it only on live stream, and we created this enhanced State of the Union experience where if you watched it, you would be able to dig deep into things that were happening, see infographics, be able to share things you saw. And then the people who would never watch the speech. Uh, they wouldn't watch it on television, they wouldn't watch it online, they wouldn't watch it on demand. And so for that group of people, we decided to do away with this idea of the embargo of the State of the Union, where you send it to every reporter in town, they then send it to all their friends on Capitol Hill, and by the time the president delivers a speech, every elite person in Washington knows what's going to be in it, and the public doesn't. And so we wanted to do away with that, sort of democratize it some, put it on medium, about 10, 15, 20 minutes before the speech, so everyone would get a chance to see it. I don't think there are a lot of people who saw it on Medium and then said, oh, boy, I'm going to turn on the TV and watch it. But they got a chance to consume it on a platform that they visit on their own, where we can take the conversation to them, and therefore we can get more eyeballs on the president's message. Well, it was a smart move on their part, keeping up with the times. <laughs> and, but let me pause and say that I come at this question from a completely different way than Dan. And if you uh, indulge me the time, I think we should give Dan Pfeiffer a great round of applause. He's given a great deal of his time to our country over the last eight years. Thank you very much, Thank Dan. You. Thank you, Dan. But having, having said that, it's easy to see what we have up on the stage, a, a generational difference, if you will. Dan, a, a, still a, a young man, uh, or an aging anchor person, but I would suggest that the answer to this question and others will draw attention to the fact that it's, it's not generational what you have here. It's, a, it's a, a difference in the roles of the society. That Dan, in the job he just left, uh, took the side of power. Journalists, and I'd like to include myself in this, but any journalist worthy of the name is constantly busy trying to shed a light on things that power would prefer the light not be on. <laughs> and we talk about the State of the Union. To put the State of the Union out, and I'll compliment them, I do think they took advantage of, of the new ways, and it was smart on their part. But a press release is not news. News comes after what the White House puts out is out there. 
For the White, it, for the White House press corps, the game changes when you adopt this method. For them, it's now, okay, the White House has put out the State of the Union, let's get busy, the good ones. Work the telephones, wear out shoe leather, find out what's really going on behind the scenes, and see that the State of the Union is basically, and forgive the word if you must, it's advertising and propaganda for the, for the political power that's in office at that particular time. Now reporters, again those that are worth the salt, take the view that news is what the people need to know that somebody, especially somebody in power, doesn't want them to know. That's news. So, so what is the role? All the rest is nearly, nearly all the rest is advertising <laughs> and propaganda. So what is the role of the White House press corps when they're not the only ones with exclusive access like they used to be? Well, uh, their role is uh, to separate brass tacks from bullshine. <laughs> their role is to analyze, to connect the dots, if you will, to say, okay, this is what the White House says, this is what the President says, what's really going on inside there, what's likely to be the opposition, where uh, also fact check, has the President said anything that doesn't match the record, maybe it doesn't match his record. These are the, this is the role of, of, of any White House correspondent worthy the name. Otherwise, they're simply stenographers taking what comes out and just regurgitating it in their uh, newspaper, television set, or for that matter, on the internet. But as, as media is changing, and media, is obviously, we can't reach the same number of people on the nightly news that we used to, the White House has had to get a lot more creative. So we're seeing the content shift. Uh, I think most notably, uh, the president on BuzzFeed, for instance, uh, where the, the White House is trying to go directly to the American public. Uh, can you talk a little about how that worked? Sure. I think, you know, our strategy is to do things like go on Jimmy Kimmel like the president did last week, or BuzzFeed, or Vox, or Vice, or some of these other things. It's sometimes discussed as the White House trying to go around the press corps, to quote, go around the filter. And we don't view it that way. We view our strategy as not either or, but and both. Like, if we were to just say we are only going to talk to the credentialed August journalists in the White House briefing room, the New York Times, CBS, ABC News, um, we would miss almost an entire generation of Americans in doing that. That the reach of that group used to be everyone, and now it's a small fraction. And that's just, whether that's good or bad, that's sort of a fact of life. And so for us to be able to communicate with people, we have to do it directly through social media platforms, like when the President's doing a Twitter town hall, or, we, or we're posting content on Facebook. Or we, have, or we have to go through new digital media outlets. But so we have to, this president has to, and the next, work harder than any previous president to communicate with the American people. And the next president after us is gonna have to work even harder than we did. That's and that's the way it's going. And so there, was, there will always, I believe, continue to be a need for reporters to, um, as Dan said, hold uh, people in power accountable and raise those questions. I mean, someday, hopefully not too soon, there'll be a president that I don't support, and I will certainly want journalists to hold that person accountable. <laughs> Um, but I think the definition of who's a reporter is going is to change over time as we have a, uh, a plethora of new outlets, new ways to become a journalist you're going to do. It's going to be a different, more diverse group of people doing it than we've had to date. Well, certainly uh, uh, presidents uh, increasingly have gone on programs like Jimmy Kimmel. Uh, to, uh, uh, mind you, I like him. I have nothing against humor, but <laughs> let's not kid ourselves. When the president goes on Jimmy Kimmel, uh, it basically to mix a little bit of information with a lot of entertainment. And let's don't kid ourselves, and let's clearly see it, being snarky or having a repartee with Jimmy Kimmel is, not, is no substitute for deep digging investigative reporting of going to documents doing analysis. Every president has started to do it in recent times, and I do agree it'll, be, you'll see more of it rather than less of it. Because, and we, you need to clearly understand, and I think Dan would agree with this and not even say so, we talk a lot about the power of the president, particularly the power of the modern presidency, which uh, can be leveraged through the internet. But the power of the presidency is in many important ways the power to persuade. And what the president is trying to do by reaching out to all these different things, go on the internet, go on Jimmy Kimmel, go on various things, and mix in, uh, interviews such as the one he did with Bill Plant, my longtime CBS News conference. Is, this is all a part of his efforts to persuade because the day, as Dan has pointed out, when the president, when the president calls and says, or has his people, I want to go on the networks, and there are only three networks, you can be guaranteed of having almost every household. 
Today, it's much more difficult. The president has to work harder to leverage his power to persuade. So what is the line? How far can we go? Well, I, look, I think the line is going to shift as there are different opportunities and different formats to use. I think it's important for people to, you know, who work in the White House, who work for politicians, to understand the context by which you're doing things. There may be a time when it makes perfect sense for the president to, to go on Jimmy Kimmel or do a BuzzFeed video, and the other times when that would seem very discordant. You know, we had uh, we had almost gone on Kimmel three times. Uh, once we had we were headed out to Los Angeles, we were going to do it. Um, it turned out, you know, it didn't, right as we were about to go was when sort of the ISIL threat blew up. Would, does it make sense for this president or any president to be cracking jokes at Jimmy Kimmel at that moment? Another time, there was a, a tragedy, a natural disaster in the country that prevented us from doing it. So you've got to understand the context to do it. And I think an important point uh, uh, to what Dan said is that if a president only did Jimmy Kimmel and BuzzFeed, like the BuzzFeed video uh, that we did, that would be very bad. Right? And I think that, that and the people would get that. They would say, when is he taking serious questions? But if you're doing, you know, if you take last week, the you know, last seven or 10 days or so of the president's media diet, did an interview with CBS White House correspondent Bill Plant that when he was down in Selma, did a round table on the way to Selma with an array of media outlets, but everyone from the New York Times to Grantland, um, did an interview, went out and did Jimmy Kimmel, and then uh, sat down with Shane Smith from Vice. So you see the full array of, diff of traditional outlets, serious news, more lighthearted stuff, digital outlets, and that's the sort of what you have to do to communicate. And what about from the news side? What is the line on serious news today? Well, first of all, let me, if I may jump back, that I think what you said holds true, but if in, this president, any president, has to be careful not to give the public the impression that he's spending most or nearly all of his time with public appearances, whether it be Jimmy Kimmel or appearing on the CBS Evening News, because the question will start going through the public's head, is he taking any time to think? Is he taking any time to do the people's business? So one has to be careful. That applies to playing golf as well as appearing on various places. Now, with, with news, uh, first of all, I think that journalists have to keep in mind uh, that is, there's a seductive power to power corporate power, labor union power, but the ultimate uh, seduction is presidential power. There's a tendency to say, listen, who am I to question the president of the United States or ask a tough question, much less a tough follow-up question. But we as a people, as a society, know how important that is as part of the system of checks and balances. So I'd say for the journalists, the line is to say to yourself, Am I, am I trying to be an insider? That is, if I'm trying to be liked. If you need to be liked in your journalist, you better get a dog. <laughs> because that's not in the nature of what you do. That if you're gonna be worthy of the name again, gotta be prepared to ask the tough question, gotta be prepared to ask the tough follow-up, even though you say to yourself, boy, the Dan Pfeiffer's inside the White House are not gonna like this. <laughs> and there's an important question, they may cut off my access that my boss is, is on me to try to get an interview with the president. If I ask a tough question at the news conference, that guy Dan Pfeiffer on the inside is going to tell the president, you know what, I don't think you ought to let this guy be interviewed. So in answer to your question of where is the line, I think a trained, experienced journalist knows intuitively, instinctively, based and partly based on the experience, where that line is. And at, at this conference this week, we're hearing about uh, a, a new forms of communication that allow not just trained journalists, but anyone to create content, things like Meerkat, obviously Snapchat. Um, as, as that happens, as the barriers to content creation come down, how does the role of journalism change? Well, I do think, like uh, the distribution systems themselves, that journalists have to be changing constantly because the, the profession is changing. But in answer to your question, with it, that content is not news. News is content, but content is not, in and of itself, is not news. And whatever the distribution systems work out to be, however journalists change and journalism changes, that much has to be branded right in our brains and in our hearts. That news is content sometimes. Content in and of itself is not news. And it's easy to forget that when we have an ever-evolving more gadgets, more technology, more terrific ways to get out. There's a tendency to confuse, well, just any content, just get, get on Twitter, get on Facebook. Uh, it, it, that's content, and you have to be 
constantly producing content. That's dangerous. That, that is <coughs> dangerous for a journalist. You know, I think Meerkat has the potential to do to television news what um, blogs did to newspaper, to, to print news, in the sense that what Meerkat does, or whether it's Meerkat or Periscope or, so, or something else that's going to come along the line, is it reduces one of the last massive institutional advantages of broadcast news. You know, in order to, to an event to be taken live, whether it's a presidential campaign event, a White House event, you know, anything that's happening in the world, previously would require a very expensive satellite truck, very expensive cables, and very expensive satellite time. And now someone can do the same thing from their phone. And so there's a real potential for democratization. And I think as people look at the 2016 presidential election, in 2004, you know, there's a new technology every election that sort of helps drive the political strategies and the news coverage of it. In 2004, it was Meetup. Um, in 2008, it was Facebook. 2012 was probably Twitter. I think it's a very real chance that 2016 it'll be Meerkat. Bold prediction. But again, I think it's important to emphasize and keep coming back to the point that not all of this, not all these new systems will, will, will have news on them. And that one of the reasons I don't think the evening news will survive 10 years from now and answer your question 10 years now, V1, is just this, said, but uh, that when these new systems come on, whether the Meerkat, Pierce, Pierce Cope, or what have you, it, it, are there professional journalists who are using these new systems? Or does the public accept it, begin to say, well, you know, it's all the same. It isn't all the same. Some of these uh, remotes will be in the hands of professional journalists. Others won't, and it's very important the public makes the difference between the two. I think what will be interesting in the future will be, we couldn't confuse new platforms with new forms of journalism, because new platforms are only ways in which exactly. journalists, news organizations, media companies are going to use those platforms to communicate either entertainment or news or sports or whatever it is that is their business. Um, there is going to be, continue to be a, a need, and I think the public will yearn for people who they have, people or institutions that they see having credibility to help curate some of this information and give and let them think through what's real, what isn't. You know, the American public has never, we sort of have this idea that the American people will just sit around, and they'll watch someone's Meerkat stream and take it as news, but the public has never been more skeptical than they are right now. You know, some would say even cynical, I think, but there's, there is a healthy, that is um, healthy in a lot of ways because what it allows is people will think twice. Like we, the White House, we put out videos, we put out photos. People don't just take that as, uh, you know, the truth handed on high. They, you know, if you, if you like Obama, you probably are more likely to think it's true. And if you really don't like Obama, no matter what it is, you probably don't think it's true. But I think what will be different now because these platforms will allow, in, like, it used to be that credibility was associated with organizations or a handful of very prominent people like Dan here, you know, mainly the television anchors. Um, now there will be more people you know, who, based on, regardless of the organization they work for, who develop their own credibility through their social media platforms, their online persona, like Ezra Klein's an example of someone who has built their own credibility and people turn to him uh, for information. So you're gonna see that in the future. Now those have more tools to get out that won't rely on the traditional sort of media oligarchy based in New York and Washington that was the filter through all information the public ever got. I think that's a good thing. Well, well picking up on this point that, number one, I have in mind as you were talking about all these new platforms, new ways of doing a thing. A professor at Princeton, uh, Harry Frankfurt, wrote this book uh, on bullshit. <laughs> that, that's the title, I don't like to use the phrase. And he said, it, the book opens with something that's very important to keep in mind when we consider this brave new world of ever increasing mighty technology, and that is that we live in an unprecedented time of bullshit. And it's extremely important to teach at a very early age the difference between skepticism and cynicism. Skepticism for a reporter is vital, cynicism is, is lethal, uh, and the difference between skepticism and cynicism, the definition of propaganda and what propaganda looks like, I think it should be taught no later than the seventh grade because we have this tsunami, constant tsunami of BS, and people have to be able to sort out you know, from what's real and what isn't. That's where, as I said before, a professional reporter comes in because he, he or she is trained to separate 
uh, brass tacks from bullshine. Well, you may, since you brought up uh, the role of, of the faces, the role of the messenger in the, in the name of reporters, we've seen two different examples, right? On the one hand, uh, we see ratings go up after Brian Williams leaves, and on the other hand, we see uh, the growth of sites like Grantland or Vox, where there's a, 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 full, a face that is powering these new brands. How important is the messenger, and is there ever going to be another Dan Rather? Well, there'll be uh, people a whole lot better than Dan Rather ever, <laughs> ever was. Uh, I think the messenger is important because somebody has to be an honest broker of information. And Dan mentioned several times the credibility that one can build or lose very quickly on the internet or for that matter on broadcast. And now more than ever, when we're talking about the new technology and using the internet, authenticity is everything. If you're authentic, and you're dedicated to carrying on a conversation with the audience, then I like your chances of being a, a distinguished journalist and being recognized as such. But the minute you begin to try to fake it, the minute you start engaging in the general bullshit of the world, uh, you reduce your chances tremendously. And I also think these days, if you don't try to carry on a conversation with the audience, that you're limiting yourself. What do you think? Well, look, I think, um you know, we always had, you know, there were always Dan Rathers and Edward Murrows and Walter Cronkites, and we'll have those going forward. They just pro may not be on the network news. They'll be on other platforms, platforms that didn't exist 10 years ago and may not exist now. But I do think it's important, you know, we sort of had, and I don't think this is what Dan is saying, but you hear this a lot in Washington. Like, you, people look back at the halcyon days of the way it used to be. And I think there was, you know, there's probably, I don't think, any more bullshit than there was before. We probably have like X amount of American bullshit and now there's just maybe new ways to get it out. And look, there are a lot more outlets now and that may make for a noisier, more chaotic news environment, both for the people being covered for, and for the audience who is uh, reading that coverage. But it doesn't, it, it is not therefore there's worse journalism. You know, there were, uh, you know, there are shitty journalists at August news organizations, and <laughs> there are really good journalists there, and there are shitty journalists at some of these new platforms, but also some great journalists there. You know, like there's an example today where uh, Aaron Schock, congressman, uh, resigned after a, a lot of investigative work was done into uh, many misdeeds, one of which being using taxpayer money to decorate his office like the set of Downton Abbey. Right. Never a good idea. Um, <laughs> But a lot of that, you know, the original story was a Washington Post style section reporter, I think. But then a lot of the follow up work was done by BuzzFeed, Blue Nation Review, which is a, a smaller progressive site. And that, and so you have really great journalism happening in places that didn't happen before. And so I think, I think there is a lot of potential chaos in the new world, but huge opportunities for more journalists, but also for the public to get a, more, a greater diversity of information. Well. Amen to that. But it gives me an opening to say, and if you'll indulge me for a moment, look, you know, I love South by Southwest. Uh, I've appeared in any number of times. I was around at the beginning. It's, it's terrific. South by Southwest is great. Uh, that, and Twitter was virtually uh, invented here, brought here for the first time. It's a national treasure. But, <laughs> but, Let's clearly see. That's like when Dan that, that, from no, our service. There is a tendency <laughs> to have sort of an orgy of, of delight about the technology and the delivery systems. And just one wee small voice to let's face up to the fact that for all of these systems, and we've talked about new ways of doing things, and particularly new outfits that do deep digging, investigative reporting of the kind that holds power accountable. That with all of this, the new technology and the new gadgets, you keep in mind, they're terrific, but the question is, for what do we use them? And we've invoked Edward Romero's name here several times, and I know it's like talking about Caesar or the Napoleonic <laughs> campaigns to talk about. But one, one thing Edward Romero did, who was the best known journalist of his age, was keep reminding us, and this is a paraphrase, which I'll bring up today, and that is, the internet is absolutely wonderful. It can teach, it can educate, it can illuminate, it can even inspire, but it can do those things only to the extent that we're determined to use it for those purposes, making money, gaining fame, all important. But there, if we don't use it for the 
for, to illuminate, to educate, to even inspire, then it is, and again paraphrasing Moreau, it's just you know, tiny electronic processors inside a case. And there is, as Moreau said, you know, there is a great and possibly decisive battle going on in the world against intolerance, uh, indifference, ignorance. And this internet can be very valuable in the same way Murrow argued that television and radio, this can be, but only to the extent that we're, we're prepared to use it for that. And we talked about, you know, future journalists, can anybody carve out a name such as a Murrow or Cronkite? If they do, I hope they'll use that name to do what Murrow did to remind us that it matters how we use all of this new gadgetry and technology. Well, so let's look at some examples. Yes, thank you. Um, let's look at some examples. Um, obviously, one of the one of the more of the of the many famous es uh, episodes across your career. Certainly, one was the coverage of Watergate. Uh, looking at these tools we have today, the, the challenges to the traditional media, the how it's harder to fund investigative journalism. If a Watergate were to happen today, would we find out? Would the journalists have the resources, the guts, uh, which is a word you use a lot to, to take it off? Well, the honest answer is I don't know. Uh, part of me says that there is a, a strong possibility, if not a probability, that at least in the early stages of Watergate, more information might have come out earlier, at least the beginnings of Watergate, some of the information might have come out earlier than at, it did at that time. We're talking about the mid-1970s. However, there is far less, uh, there are far less resources in any news or, uh, newspaper, magazine, television station to do the kind of deep digging investigative reporting, which eventually exposed what, and let's remind ourselves, Watergate is shorthand for a widespread criminal conspiracy that was led by the President of the United States himself, exclamation point. But you know, it's been so long ago, I think the better example now would be the Snowden case. And what happened with Snowden? Snowden felt, uh, as a matter of conscience, he was going to unload this tremendous dump load of information. But where did he go to do that? He went to journalistic institutions, first the Guardian, then the Washington Post, the New York Times, to do it. And as a consequence of that, I think the, the, the Snowden revelations got much more and better exposure earlier because of the internet than Watergate got in the early stages. Hmm. Look, I think, as Dan said, you know, no one really knows, but you know, our experience, uh, my experience over the last many years, as you watch, particularly the last handful here where there's been such a proliferation of outlets, is that instead of just having one Woodward and one Bernstein working on the story, you would have you know, a thousand Woodwards and a thousand Bernsteins, because the way it sort of feels like whenever there is something that is like a really interesting you know, juicy story, you know, particularly if it has the whiff of scandal, real or otherwise, is you, ba it's basically like a swarm of locusts, big and small, you know, from the New York Times and the Associated Press to independent journalists who are just like digging through on their own time, uh, digging through either campaign finance reports or old video, um, and they like, and they eat the story, like just devour the story really fast, and I think, so I think that's one way in which the new, the new media environment would be helpful because it's just there's, the competition is so intense right now that no one wants to get beat, so everyone goes at the big story right away because they want traffic, they want viewers, um, they want Facebook likes, they want tw retweets, whatever, whatever metric they're using for success these days. I think the other advantage of this environment to pick a different um, recent example is because of there are so many different outlets now and such an opportunity for people to have a platform, that if you take um, the Iraq war debate, if that were to happen right now, we may end up going to war in Iraq, you know, I think that, you know, that's still an open question, but I can guarantee you that there would be a thousand outlets and a thousand individuals who would be combing through Judy Miller's New York Times reporting about the weapons of mass destruction. We would have at least had a larger debate because, you know, a lot of these newer outlets, BuzzFeed is one of them, you know, they, the reporters, a lot of them have a different set of experiences than the people who cover it for the New York Times or the Washington Post. And they've, they have sort of a, they, a contrarian nature where if everyone is saying X, they're gonna try to figure out why X is wrong. And I think that, that can be really good for debate on a whole host of issues um, you know, going forward. All true, 
But there's a, a wee small part of me that says, remember how much consolidation of media that we've had in recent years to the extent that I think by and large, many people in the public don't realize this. As we said here today, no more than six, my count is four, no more than six very large international conglomerate companies control more than 80% of the true national distribution of news in this country. Exclamation point, think about it for a moment. So before we leap to the idea, I agree with you that there'd be like a swarm of locusts in the coverage, but because there's this consolidation of power, whether the story would take real traction despite so many outside of it, because the, this corp, what I've called the corporatization of news, follow me, the corporatization of news with ever increasingly larger companies controlling more and more of the true national distribution, those corporations have business in Washington that they need done. And there is uh, this corporations, very large corporations that control most of the true national distribution of news are in bed with, with big government whether that big government be in the hands of the Democrats or the Republicans at any particular time. And the two of them work together in many important ways for their mutual benefit, not for the benefit of the public at large. That being the case, I'm not so sure with Watergate. Yes, you would have any number of places on the internet uh, pick, picking away, but if, if you didn't have as a head of at least one of the major corporations somebody with spine, if you prefer that word as guts, <laughs> who would say, I don't care what our lobbying operation in Washington says, we're gonna leave our reporters alone to report this story. If you didn't have that, it might not get the traction. What I think is different now is it used to be if you know, the New York Times was gonna run some story or the Washington Post or whatever, you know, CBS, whatever mainstream news outlet is, that you know, we either thought was wrong or we would ask them to hold off on it for some reason for national security reasons or something like that. Like, you could call up the bureau chief or the publisher or the editor and you'd, have a, you'd bring him in and have a conversation and say, please don't do this. You know, I mean, not this happens that often, but some people try to trade things. Like, if you don't run this, we'll tell you, uh, you know, you'll be first dibs on when we make the actual announcement. That meeting usually now lasts two seconds because right. they now know that even if I can convince the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Associated Press not to do this, BuzzFeed or Vice are gonna do it anyway. And so the role of the um, mainstream media gatekeepers is massively diminished in this world, but they are, you know, they're in the middle of an existential crisis in a lot of ways. You know, in many ways, BuzzFeed and Vice are better funded than the New York Times and the Washington Post. You know, they are able to hire more reporters, they can pour more resources on some stories because they have a different business model. And so the power, I think, of these, you know, sort of filters or gatekeepers is diminished in the new world. And, you know, I think there's, uh, that's the, what pushes against the tremendous consolidation. I think that's really true and alarming as it relates to people we traditionally think of as our news sources. But for journalism or news writ large, you know, th there's diversity of funding sources, diversity of ownership, diversity of point of view, diversity uh, in background of the reporters, and that's like a great thing. And can we go deeper with all these new channels? I mean, what, compared to the nightly news where you have to speak to all of America, does the fact that there is competition, that we're seeing more vertical hierarchy and organization in terms of news, whether that's in, in Grantland and sports or in Vox and policy, can we go deeper and have deeper conversations than we used to be able to happen on network TV? Well, we can go deeper, but that's the question of the day. Will we do it on a widespread basis? Journalism, American journalism, is in crisis, and it has been in crisis for some time, and the reason is that the old business model for financing the most important kinds of journalism, which are first-class international reporting, deep digging investigative reports, these are the most expensive, and they're also the ones that can cause the most controversy. So the new media power, to use this phrase, can say to themselves, listen, why do either one of these things? Because advertising, no longer supports it. The old model that the networks used for years, advertisers supported, and the advertiser pays for the investigative reporting, the first class international reporting, that model is gone. Up to and including the present time, nobody has come up with a business model uh, that substitutes for that. Therefore, journalism is in what the Catholic Church, I'm not Catholic, but they, they have a good phrase, calls an interregnum. Interregnum, the old order is gone. The new order is not yet in place. 
in terms of a business model that was on a sustained and widespread basis, pay for investigative reporting and first class international reporting, frankly, a lot of people is a little like they're throwing jello up against the bark <laughs> and hoping to see what will stick. And so far, not much has stuck. Well, what about partisan journalism there? I mean, we're seeing some do better on the partisan side. Fox, MSNBC, good for democracy, bad for democracy? Well, to go back to your previous question for a second, I think here's the really good thing about the diversity of sources and the fact that people can, or that certain organizations can specialize in certain things, right? And so if you, let's say that the internet did not exist and we were um, hard to imagine at this conference, but let's pretend like it didn't for a second. And we're in last fall when we were in the middle of Ebola mania on the news. If you wanted to learn about anything else other than Ebola, you were shit out of luck, right? And so, um, but now, you, you know enough to know you're not gonna get Ebola by going to the mall, uh, but you're really interested in healthcare policy or veterans policy or energy policy. You now have places, you, you don't rely on one all powerful um, news director or news producer to tell you what, to give you, like, it used to be like a, um, it's like a fixed menu. Now it's a buffet and you can go choose what you want. And that's, that's a really good thing. Now it may be what the, new, what the news is covering is like a very serious issue. Like they focused on ISIL almost exclusively for months. And that, you know, that's an incredibly important news story and people should do that. But there may be people who are interested in other things and now they have a chance to do that. As well as the partisan news organizations, Look, I think that, I mean, that's not actually a new phenomenon in our time. It's new to television in the last few years. Um, and it is, I don't know whether it's good or bad, it just is. Um, people, you know, have a tendency these days to seek out, um, you know, information sources that reinforce their views. And that is a problem if there is uh, no other way for them to get information or if they're unwilling to go to look for information that's contrary to them. And that, that is the ultimate, uh, this shift in uh, information distribu dis distribution con and consumption is what all of this is about. It's what um, you know, organizations and political figures and governments are trying to figure out. It's what news is trying to figure out on the other end, which is the idea that the broadcast model where people just stand up and tell everyone things is over. What exists now is a network model where I say, you know, I hold up, you know, or Dan Rather goes up and says, you know, says news or analysis, and that goes to a handful of people, and those handful of people share it to their other people. And the challenge for um, anyone who's trying to communicate, if you're in the news, your challenge is to understand that model and how do you uh, survive in it. And if you're trying to communicate to the world as a company or a, or a political figure, um, is how do you break into those network circles? And it, your vehicles for doing, in those, into those communication circles, tight communication circles, and your vehicle for doing that is no longer just CBS or ABC News. It could be, you know, it's digital influencers. It's influencers around the world, particularly digital influencers, who have, may not be well known to people in Washington, but have large followings on right. Facebook or Twitter um, or other social platforms that, but, and have credibility in those issues. Um, and identifying those people and getting into it is, is what the real challenge is. Well, in answer to your question, I think, in a broad, general way, it's good for democracy. The more voices, the better. Uh, however, in today's environment, that it, the audience is so fractured, it's almost impossible for anybody to gather the kind of huge news audience that the evening news for broadcast, for example, once did, that somebody has to be honest brokers of information. That is, if you have one station that clearly is dedicated to putting forward one party, and another station is clearly dedicated to putting forward another party, I would say propaganda, uh, advertising, BS, whatever you want to call it, somewhere there has to be what I call honest brokers of information. And what Dan referred to as gatekeepers, it's, it, let's not get into a matter of semantics, but yes, gatekeepers in a way, but somebody who holds enough to say, listen, I'm not for the Republican Party, I'm not for the Democratic Party, insofar as it's humanly possible. I'm gonna give you the facts I think you need and the information I think you need. I'm gonna separate out as, as best I can the propaganda, the advertising, the self-promotion, the campaigning. Now, it used to be that we had a kind of a national hearth. The evening news for a long time was the national hearth for news. Now, I quite agree that if you look, if you spend the time to look, you can get a much better de 
diversification of opinion. But increasingly, I think, some would say decreasingly, but I think increasingly people don't do that. And as a consequence, so many people tune to one station, a radio station or a television station, to say, they think like I think. It's a kind of uh, echo chamber. This can lead to ignorance, and ignorance is fatal for a, co a country such as ours. We have a constitutional republic based on the principles of freedom and democracy. The whole core idea is an informed citizenry. And Thomas Jefferson, and I think I have the quote right, said any nation that believes that it can be ignorant and free is believing what never has been and never will be. And my point is, the more people tune to just the station where they hear their own opinions, the less good that is for democracy and freedom. I think there's a generation. Um, there's a generational difference here too, which is you see, I mean, look at the demographic of the Fox News audience, which is much older. The network news audience is much older. Millennials go to a lot of different sources. Most of them are not traditional news sources, but they get a lot of information. A lot of it comes through their uh, Facebook and Twitter feeds. And so they're getting a diversity of opinion. I think that's very good. Um, I think the other thing that goes to um, People are more skeptical now, uh, more skeptical of institutions, more skeptical of the news and journalists, and that's a good thing, I think. What, but also now they have the tools to explore that skepticism. You can do it through the internet. And another thing that I think is gonna be very helpful going forward is sort of the big data and open data movement, which has allowed people, there's a lot of places you can go now and get, you, if, you, if you question an assumption, you can go uh, check that information. And I think and it gives people a chance to do their own research in a way that was never possible before. Um, so that's really good. I do think that we have sometimes have this view that, you know, people are just getting lazier or dumber, you know? And I think that, um, you know, that has certainly not been my experience as I work for the president we travel the country, is that people, particularly young people, are amazingly intellectually curious. Um, they are rightfully skeptical of governments and the news and um, are very interested in seeking out the information they need to make decisions in their lives. And you know, I think every generation uh, thinks the next generation is, uh, you know, is the, end of, the end of America as we know it, and, and every time we've come out struggling where we with them where we were before, and now because of the internet and the, and the changing media environment, people have more tools to succeed than ever before, and that's a great thing. So let's just uh, we'll, in a, we'll talk a little about advice for the folks in the room and on the live stream for a second, and then we'll start to take some questions from Twitter at Ask Dan, obviously. Uh, so send us your questions. Um, just a little bit on advice. So if you're talking to a startup in this room or someone who needs to get their message out today, how do you cut through? What, what's going to work? Well, look, I think you know this is the struggle we've had in the White House for six years as we went from an antiquated, you know, traditional media oriented operation into one that is doing Vice and BuzzFeed and putting the State of the Union out on Medium. And I think for any, you know, you know, wannabe media organization or content provider, the key thing is to understand your audience and then in this day and age, go to where the conversation is happening. You know, as opposed to, you know, this is the big challenge that we face is, you know, is over, you know, originally everything that was designed to bring people to your website. You know, we realized that it's pretty hard to get people, particularly young people, to go to a government website for information. But if we go to Medium, or Facebook, or Twitter, or Snapchat, and we you know, have content um, that, is, that speaks to that community, and every one of those audiences is different, and the formats of use there is different, but content that speaks to that audience and is tailored for that medium, um, you have a chance to get. So understanding where the audience that you're seeking is, and then how to go get them, is I think the key to success for everyone, big or small. Well, not just from a journalism standpoint, but it is a journalism standpoint. For, for the bedrock of journalism is writing, to know how to write well. Yes, if you can write fast, that's an advantage. When you talk about creating any kind of content, you want to know, he said, to get your message across. Good writing is a result of good thinking. Critical thinking and knowing how to write will help you tremendously. Whether you have a journalistic site or in journalism, or you're pushing forward some other kind of content. Got it, and just real quickly, journalism school, yes or no? If you're advising your son or daughter today. I'm tempted to punt because I'll get myself <laughs> in trouble. I think it depends on the journalism school. Don't want to duck the question. 
But if the journalism school is emphasizing not just how to use the new tools, the new technology at hand, but also the fundamentals of the craft, such as how to report and write, how to separate bullshine uh, from brass tacks, then journalism school may be worth it. But I would say to someone aspiring to be a journalist, look at where you think you're gonna learn to write the best. Look at where you think you're gonna be taught to spend a lifetime of ever trying to improve your writing and go to that school, whether they have a journalism school or not. This is, I'm probably not the best person for this, neither being a journalist and having delayed graduate school so long that I got too old to go. Um, but I, look, I think for the first time in decades, it's a really good time to get into journalism. There are well-funded new outlets that are hiring young people. The older outlets, um, you know, are struggling economically, have bought out a lot of their more experienced reporters, and so now younger, this isn't great for democracy necessarily, but younger people are getting chances to do more earlier in their career, and you've got a chance to get in there uh, right away and start doing some serious stuff if you have the chops to do it, and I, I think there's probably no time like the present. Great, so let's turn to questions from the audience. Um, first question from Claire. The landscape is not just network news versus the internet. How might cable TV anchors like John Oliver shape the future of reporting? For either one of you. Well, I can use an example. I think, look, um, cable, you know, entertainment slash news folks like John Oliver or Stephen Colbert in his previous iteration or John Stewart, obviously, most famously, um, you know, have huge audiences and they have platforms they can use for advocacy for their issues. I can tell you as someone who worked closely on this issue, that John Oliver fundamentally changed the debate on net neutrality. <laughs> I mean, the uh, cable companies have had Congress on lockdown for a very long time, and when John Oliver drew attention to this and uh, generated activism, the you know the most comments that any rule has ever had, you know, any regulations ever had, was on net neutrality. And the, with the day the president came out for Title II regula regulation, every single Democrat backed him. And it's in part because John Oliver drew attention to a very esoteric issue that a lot of people wouldn't have known about without his platform. Well, it underscores something we touched on earlier. Uh, the potential is there to affect things greatly, provided you have credibility, which comes from authenticity, and you carry on the conversation with the audience. The potential is there. John, what you just described with John Oliver is a good case in point. That's great. Uh, next question. Do you find young journalists are more aggressive and spend less time developing relationships with those that are seeking their information from? I do. I don't know that they're more aggressive. Quite honestly, there is a tendency among young journalists and older journalists such as myself are probably responsible for some of this, of saying, you know, don't take a risk. Don't get involved in controversy. Just get in the middle of the herd, move with the herd, because that way you, you, you don't get damaged, you'll get knocked out Journalism. So I don't think they're more aggressive uh, than their predecessors were. But in spending time developing sources, this is a sore point in, within journalism when we debate. The pressure is on individual journalists now to you know, do, uh, do your tweets, uh, do Facebook, do blogs, answer uh, rockets from the home office, can you match Joe's story today? This cuts down on the time for making telephone calls, wearing out shoe leather to go talk to people, spending time on the internet researching, and for that matter, yes, in the library and with documents researching. And this doesn't lead to better journalism. It, may, it means more hits on the inter internet, but it doesn't lead to better journalism. Well, do you feel that you have more freedom in what you put out today, than when you, or are you beholden to driving views than when you were at CBS? No, I don't feel uh, I, had, I have any more or any, any less freedom. When I was at CBS News, I haven't been at CBS News for what, I don't know, nine years, uh, that the, the company for most of the time, most of the 44 years I was there, there was a, a firewall between the corporate interests. The, the, the corporate leadership took the view, news is a public service. By the way, this has disappeared almost entirely. News is now a profit center. But it was news is a public service, and we, had, uh, we were free to do anything, which, which is the reason the CBS News record, set aside my own record, is filled uh, with distinguished reporting on, for example, civil rights, the McCarthy era, Vietnam War, Watergate, right on up, because we had that freedom. I don't, I don't feel any more or less freedom today than I did in 1975. Anything on young journalists? Uh, look, I think all journalists, young and old, um, have 
are have less time to suspend developing relationships than ever before because they are constantly writing, constantly filing, constantly tweeting, and um, so the, like the work habit used to be get up, work the phones till the White House briefing, go to the White House briefing, come back, work the phones, go get a drink with someone, file your story, and now they are, you know, you know the average White House reporter has probably filed three or four times either via Twitter or the, or the newspaper's or network's blog by the time they get to the White House briefing, and so there's simply not time for that. I'd like to tack on an addendum. I would say beginnings, it's very hard to pinpoint the exact time, but, but I think with all the networks, but they're certain to at CBS, beginning sometime after the millennium, in the early 2000s, there begin to be signs that this constant change of ownership with each new ownership there was less public service talk and more talk about how to monetize better your product. And there were pressures uh, from Washington and elsewhere that were attempted and sometimes successful. But I was speaking about the length and breadth of my time at CBS when I said I felt free most of the time. Got it. Uh, next question from Colin. Should we attempt to certify legitimate news stories and outlets, uh, particularly as the buzz feeds of the world grow stronger? I would say no. Look, Absolutely I, not. I think that is for the audience to decide. You know, and I, look, BuzzFeed sometimes you know gets a, a bad rap because of the listicles and the quizzes, yeah. but and you know they did a video that was entertainment related with the president. But then, you know, their top news person Ben Smith sat down with the president for like 20 minutes and gave as tough and fair an interview as if he had worked at the New York Times or the Washington Post or anywhere else. And so. Um, you know, they, have, they do some very serious news there, and they have used their resource advantage in a way to cover parts of the world that others have not. I mean, so they did some of the best reporting out of the Ukraine and some of the other war zones that, that the new traditional news organizations who would cut their foreign staff have been unable to do. Well, it, let, the, let, the, let the audience decide, the public decides. Let the audience decide. Um, what about uh, challenges for, for folks in this room? Uh, whether, you know, you've both been in these fields for a long time now, there are probably some challenges that you weren't able to solve, some problems you weren't able to solve. Are there, would you, is there anything you would pose as a challenge to the audience of South by Southwest? What can, you know, these are folks that can start companies, apps, uh, re, you know, revolutions, literally. Are there, uh, is there something that you would, you would ask them to, to try to solve and tackle? Come up with a business model that can sustain on a widespread basis and uh, going forward for a very long time to come a business model that will support deep digging, investigative reporting, first class uh, international news. Hmm. I, I, I've searched for the business model. There are few, very few on the internet that show promise, but nobody has yet to come up with one that can do it on a widespread continuing basis. Look, my experience with President Obama dates back to the beginning of his 2008 campaign. And at the core of that campaign was an interactive relationship between the campaign and the president and his supporters. And one of the things that we, uh, the code we were unable to crack in the government was how to ex transfer that interactive relationship to government, where you can have a two, where it's not just the government telling people things, but the people can interact back and forth. And so the more people can help with us, that's great. We have, in recent uh, months, brought on some of the smartest people from Silicon Valley, Megan Smith, Alex McGillivray, DJ Patel, uh, Mikey Dickerson, to come in, and we're trying to bring more people in who can help us crack that code. But, like we can unlock so much potential to do good for people if we can leverage the better leverage the ingenuity and energy of the American people to um, make government a two-way street. Hmm. Okay, and then just a couple last ones from from the audience. Uh, from Emma, do journalists and editors need to stop dwelling on the business model and get back to exposing real news? Yes, I could vote for that. <laughs> However, there's no way to get back to exposing the real news I said before, on a widespread and continuing basis, the kind of news we talked about at the beginning, the kind of news that says, listen, we, we, not only, we report truth to power and we speak truth to power, without a new business model, uh, you're, you're going to have less and less of that as we go forward. So it isn't one or the other. You have to have a new business model in order to get back to the basics. You never met anybody who believed in the basics stronger than I do, but I know the reality of you walk into the news director or the president of the news division and say, we need to cover uh, Afghanistan. And he says, either go do it if he has the resources, but increasingly is, you know what? We, re we just don't have the money to establish a, a bureau in Kabul. Uh, 
can't you put four people in a room and have them shout at one another about Afghanistan <laughs> rather than sending people to it? Yeah, I agree with that. Got it. Um, one from Taylor. What is journalism's responsibility in correcting misinformation by politicians? Uh, and a great example, a question of climate change. Well, look, um, it could be incredibly annoying from someone sitting in my seat sometimes, <laughs> but it's incredibly important. And I think this is one of the real um, positive developments is we have had sites like PolitiFact and fact-checking sites have really taken hold in a much more aggressive way in recent years. I think that's a really important thing. Now, climate change goes to one of the great challenges we have, which is because, as I was talking about before, we have these closed um, uh, communication circles where people who are just have the same view are talking to each other. And it's incredibly hard for people who know that climate change is real to break into those circles and communicate to those people. And you know, it's very important because too often uh, journalism, particularly in this day and age, devolves to he said, she said. You know, many scientists say climate change is real, but a couple of scientists funded by the oil industry, which is the part they never mentioned, say it isn't. And when there are incontrovertible data-based facts, you know, it's important for the news to call balls and strikes. Um, you know, sometimes that's going to be great for my boss if I work for policy. Sometimes it's going to be terrible, but I think it's incredibly important. Well, in answer to the question, the responsibility of the journalist is great uh, as a, a part of the system of checks and balances. And you say co correcting uh, uh, different uh, things that aren't true of climate change might be an example. The responsibility of the journalist who's worthy of the name is to be what I described earlier, is that honest broker of information and not be afraid, not be fearful that, well, if, if, we, if we quote the the scientific, overwhelming scientific knowledge on climate change, and we don't equate it with two or three scientists who may be financed by uh, people who are, have a commercial interest, then you aren't fulfilling the, the role of a journalist as it should be. Uh, permanent funding uh, certainly is an option for various sites to be what we call truth squads. But the essence of journalism is to do just exactly what this, qu this questioner mm -hmm. suggests. And that is to, without fear or favor, pull no punches, play no favorites, find out the truth or as close to the truth as humanly possible and tell it, and don't be afraid that it's gonna get you in trouble. Well, and that brings us to our, our next question here. Isn't journalism too important to depend on a business model, but is there a government-funded option or a philanthropic, philanthropic option like the Texas Tribune down I don't here? think in our United States of America that there's a, a place for a government, government funding option. I recognize there are different few points about that, and I clearly understand that I've, I've never worked for anything other than uh, in commercial radio, television, and newspapers, and, and I do believe it. However, we have to keep driving home the point to those who, who, who own the distribution systems, and particularly the largest distribution systems, that there is a public service component to news, the kind of quality news of integrity that we need should be seen as a public service. Yes, sometimes it can make money, but for journalism at its best, that isn't to be the, the sole purpose of it. And we're very close to that being the case now. If you go to the largest media empires in this country today and try to talk about public service as opposed to ratings, demographics are making money, you're likely to be accused of one or two things. Either you're a candidate for the funny farm or you're smoking something very expensive. <laughs> Look, there are many days when I worked in the White House that we would have loved to have had an Obama news network that would do what we wanted, but I think that is generally like a really bad idea, um, and we should, and I don't think that, that will ever happen in this country, nor should it. Um, I think that, you know, there is, you know, I think there is some potential in some of these philanthropic news efforts where you can, you know, people can fund large-scale investigative reporting. We're seeing some of that, and that may be, I don't think that will solve the whole problem, but that may be a complementary way um, to deal with the sort of the business profit funded model that we've had to date. Great. Um, so just last question for either of you. What's the next big thing you want to tackle? I don't think you're retiring anytime soon. <laughs> or Dan? Who, who, who gives what to whom in political campaigns, particularly presidential campaigns, keeping in mind the next presidential campaign will probably be a $4 billion, $4 billion presidential campaign uh, I've spent a lifetime working on who gives money to what, but uh, my goal is the more I can explain and report to people the facts of who gives what to whom, expecting to get what, 
in a $4 billion presidential campaign is always kind of a North Star to follow. Terrific. And Dan? Well, I quit my job a week ago without a new job, so this is like a very important question for me. Um, you know, but I am tremendously fascinated by um, the dramatic change we're seeing and how people consume and distribute information. And I think as we are moving toward, you know, as things like Meerkat come along, Snapchat comes along, and we're moving in the broadcast cable TV model is sort of disintegrated before our eyes, that we are about to um, enter a revolution that's going to make the change to date in media over the last 10 years seem small. And, you know, that will be true in news, that'll be true in sports, that'll be true in entertainment. And, you know, what trying to figure out how to navigate that space and where it's going is something that's incredibly fascinating to me. And whatever I do next, I want to find some way to be involved in that. Cool. Well, thank you both for your time. Let's give these guys a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now we're going to be able to have, you know, a simulcraft of our own mind that we can, instead of just talking to ourselves in our mind, as I think most of us do when we wake up in the morning or the end of a day or commuting or having a drink or whatever, we'll be able to have a best friend that is also ourselves and talk to ourselves.